Well, I have to say today I am super, super excited to be interviewing my featured expert. But before I tell you who she is, have you ever been out on a hike and you're going, oh, if I just had something to fuel me, I would be able to go another two or three miles. Or maybe you've been on a run, you've participated in marathons and at that halfway point, you're really dragging for energy or just your everyday living that you are hitting that point in your day where your energy is dropping. Well, today, my featured expert has a solution. Hi, this is Kathleen Gage with Plant-Based Eating for Health, and my featured expert is Bobby Giudicelli, and she is one of the founders of Read the Ingredients Food, and I have to say, Read the Ingredients is awesome. I actually had my breakfast bar today, uh, went on a nice run in 38-degree weather, and then I had this bar, and I got to tell you, my energy is off the charts because it's all natural. So with that, I want to introduce Bobby. Great to have you here. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It is such a pleasure for me. Well, I know that, you know, there are points in our life where we we hit a wall with life experiences and that wall forces us to really tap into what our passion is and what our life purpose is. And it was about 10 years ago, you had three very, very uh, big events occur in your life uh, to do with um, your father, your sister, and you. So why don't you tell folks what that was and how it changed the trajectory of your life? Sure. So uh, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, my sister actually died of ovarian cancer and I was her primary caretaker and I was witness to every pain and agony and awful experience that that was for her for her last year of life. And uh, and that really woke me up. Um, And then a few years, a year or two later, I became the primary caretaker. Uh, for my father, who was aging and uh, and and had advanced advancing dementia, was the scariest part of it because my father had always been pretty sharp. Um, interestingly, at, and at the same time, the third element was my own complete fatigue that no traditional Western medicine doctor could explain. There was such extreme fatigue. And the common thread between my sister, my father and me is that we all thought we lived a healthy lifestyle. We were all very fit. We were all very active our entire lives. Um, My father skied until he was 80 years old. Um, You know, it was that was the lifestyle. My sister was a spinning teacher at at her local gym. And and I was always very active at, at different sports and different activities. So we all believe that eating in moderation, so on and so forth, and and with no real understanding of nutrition that we were all living a healthy lifestyle. I was convinced after those three incidences or those three um, moments in time that no, there's something here and it's not about being exercising more or staying thinner or whatever the thing that drove us, it wasn't about that. It really, really had to be something else. And I really started to take a good look at nutrition and educating myself since I wasn't finding the medical professional out there who could help me in that journey or really help me understand what was happening in my body. And that started it. So what was it that you discovered about your your health and the nutrition side of things that was an eye opener to you? So uh, the very first thing that I did is I took a look at what I thought I had always said, I eat healthy Mm -hmm. and I ate red meat in very small amounts. I ate mostly chicken when I was eating meat. I loved fish and seafood. Um, I ate a decent uh, amount of vegetables, uh, but the one thing in my diet that I could not, just could not, thought I could not give up was diet soda. I was a diet soda and artificial sweetener in my coffee addict. Uh, So between the caffeine and the artificial sweeteners and the consumption of those, um, I decided, and I had been told so many times over the years, first of all, Diet soda doesn't help you lose weight. Diet soda will Mm -hmm. give you other issues. There's other problems, so on and so forth. And I gave up diet soda. I just said, that's it. And I am talking about a six or eight pack a day habit since I was 16 years old. 
Um, I was one of the original, I'm sure one of the original consumers of tab soda. And uh, while well, I'm probably aging. You just, aging. I was going to say, you just yeah. aged yourself. Okay, yes. I love it. I so love it went it. from tab to fresca to, thank goodness, every company made a diet soda and, and I could then branch out. So from 16 to my mid 50s, I was a diet soda addict. And uh, I just decided it's time to pull the plug on that first. Mm -hmm. So I eliminated that and a million things happened in regards to taking that out of my diet. The very first thing that happened that was so noticeable is my taste buds started to come around and things that I would eat that had sugar in them were way too sweet, just way too sweet. Everything was too sweet. And then I realized as I would eliminate sugar along with the diet, the artificial sweeteners, that I could taste everything better, no matter mm -hmm. what I was eating. Broccoli tasted better. Beans tasted better. Um, even the fish I was eating tasted better because it had more. It's almost like it's almost like sugar deadens your taste buds. And, uh, and, it, and, then, and then there's also the addictive part of, and it does happen even with artificial sweeteners where you have your insulin is being fooled. And mm -hmm. so you end up being addicted to sugar. Right. Um, I have since learned that that addiction actually comes from the microbiome. It does not come from a trigger in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that was hugely helpful. So to answer, to go back to the question, and we can come back to the sugar issue, but to answer your question fully. So I eliminated sugar, I eliminated, uh, or I significantly reduced sugar, I eliminated um, artificial sweeteners. And noticing that the next thing that I noticed was well, it's a too long a story to tell you how I even came to this, but I decided I really should eliminate gluten. And I come to find out I am one of I am one of those people that's extremely gluten sensitive. Within three weeks after I eliminated gluten, I felt like a brand new person. I mean, I was truly reborn in other areas besides appetite. Besides, physically, I was feeling better. So where the sugar helped my appetite be steered in the right direction for healthier foods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the gluten actually physically made me feel so much better. Let, um, let me let me stop you there because you know gluten is an area that there's a lot of confusion on. Like, what is gluten? What foods is gluten in? Right. And uh, first of all, how did you identify the fact that you were gluten sensitive? And where is gluten? How how do people sure. know what to eliminate and what to add in? Sure. So gluten primarily comes from three different grains. It's uh, wheat, rye, and barley. Mm -hmm. Now, the gluten piece that comes out of those grains is used as a filler in other food because what gluten is, it, gluten is, is an emulsifier. Basically, it's the thing that sticks the bread together when you bake bread with, with wheat or rye. Okay. It's what makes it stick together. If you bake bread with almond flour or with um, any of the rice flour, you need to put a starch in there. You need to put something in there for it to stick together. You can't just bake with that. So that's what gluten is. But it's used as a filler in other products. For example, a simple one that comes to mind because I got painfully aware of it early on is it's in soy sauce. I don't know why, I can't explain wow. it, but there's gluten in soy sauce. So there's a non-gluten natural form of soy sauce called tamari. So anyone who's gluten sensitive, you can have all the soy sauce you want in the form of tamari rather than having it in regular soy sauce. Mm -hmm. um, what gluten is to people is it, it, it's an inflammatory agent. It is as much an inflammatory agent as um, sugar is. The thing that is very specific that happens inside our body with gluten that makes it a different type of intolerance is it creates something called leaky gut. So within our digestive system, within our microbiome, we have all kinds of um, bacteria, good and bad. Mm -hmm. And the bad bacteria that comes with eating the wrong foods, uh, eating foods that were not really made to eat, like lots of meat or animal products or um, gluten or things like that, that are really not okay. And, and a lot of times people develop that intolerance because of the genetically modified 
uh, aspect of wheat. Right. Um, but the, what happens is you actually perforate with very small perforations within your gut, within your, your intestinal tract, your digestive tract. And so they call it leaky gut syndrome. And what happens is that bad bacteria infiltrates the rest of your body and your immune system is alerted to that. And your immune system starts attacking all kinds of things. And they actually say that um, there is, that I have read research that says I'm not a scientist at all, but I believe and I really look at the research that's done uh, that's non-biased, that's not tied mm -hmm. to a company mm -hmm. or a pol government political organization or whatever. And they say that cancer is one of the big uh, pieces of, of the cause of cancer is this leaky gut syndrome is this bad bacteria that's coming into your system that doesn't belong there. Huh. And the only way to, um, well, before I get to that, so let's finish the gluten thing. So I, so I did eliminate gluten. Now, how I even thought to do that was not through this research was, was because two things uh, played a role in that. Number one, I've had, because I have been so active and in many sports, I've had many, many orthopedic surgeries, many. And around all of those, both the injury themselves as well as the surgery as the fix, there is a ton of inflammation of just your body fighting. Well, when you are also, your diet also has inflammatory agents, that swelling is a lot worse and the inflammation is a lot worse. So just to give you an example, I've had three back surgeries in my life. One uh, was before I changed my diet at all. Mm -hmm. the recovery from that was very painful. And before I could even comfortably walk was probably about two months. Wow. The second time I had the same back surgery uh, at a different level of my back, um, I, was, I was, had a very cleaned up diet, but was not yet 100% vegan. And the recovery was major majorly easier. Um, I was up and walking fairly comfortably within two weeks, came home from the hospital with like no painkillers. I'm not somebody who can tolerate normal anti-inflammatories, anti-inflammatory drugs anyway, like Advil or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but no use for any anti-inflammatory meds, no painkillers and was walking comfortably in about a week. Wow. Uh, the third time I was 100% vegan. Uh, the third time was about two years ago that I had back surgery. I mean, it was five days in the hospital on heavy meds. I hated that part, uh, heavy painkillers, but the doctor insisted you take these prescriptions home with you. By the time I left the hospital, I didn't need them at all. And I was up and walking. I was walking with my dogs within about three to four days. That's incredible. And yeah. And these are major, major back surgeries. So uh, likewise, I've had major, you know, I've had 10 knee surgeries and, and diet was everything. I was gluten-free by the time I had my knee replacement and the inflammation was enormously less than what the doctor had seen on any other patient. And, you know, so this, so this is all related, this inflammation in, in your, in your mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. is all related to diet. Um, so the, the other thing that happened with me identifying gluten as a problem is my husband had always done all the cooking. Uh, we raised three boys with my husband who loved to cook. I had a horrible relationship with food. So I was more than happy to pass that off to him. And, um, and, and he cooked typical. He grew up in a, in a household where his parents came over from France. They had bread with every meal right. they had pasta, you know, they did eat a lot of pasta and things like that. And I was noticing uh, for about eight years when I first moved up to where I live now in Northern California, my husband still was working far away. So he would be away all during the week and I would be home on the weekend on, uh, he would be home on the weekends. So during the week I was eating whatever I could throw together, salads mm -hmm. and whatever, mm -hmm. and no bread, no pasta, no anything. And I was feeling so much better. He'd come home on the weekend, he'd make a meal. It would include pasta or bread or what. And I would go, what is wrong? I really am not feeling well. And it was like, how can it, you know, how can it be such a difference? So it dawned on me, I went, ah, oh, I'm eliminating. First, I thought I'm eliminating complex carbohydrates, which eliminated the bread and the pasta, mm -hmm. but it also eliminated mm -hmm. things like potatoes and other starches. Well, then I started to put two and two together and I said, wait a minute, 
just let's eliminate the gluten and let's put the potatoes back in and see what happens. And it was like, I mean, it was magic. So I completely went off gluten and it turned out within two months, if I ate anything with gluten, I would know it. I That's mean, incredible. I would know it in a bad way. And so, so I'm curious, when did you go hundred percent vegan? About four years ago. Okay. Okay. And uh, obviously that helped with um, not only your recovery time, but other areas of your life. And that that's what really triggered your desire to create uh, a food that is a hundred percent whole food, vegan, uh, plant-based. It's like, it, it, this is so magical. The, the read the ingredients. It's like, I've got three of them at my desk right now. And um, tell us about, you know, how you decided to start read the ingredients and why this is a better choice for people, because it truly is, you know, when you eat it, you know that you've eaten a, a good meal in a breakfast loaf. So why would this be better than let's say the off the shelf stuff that you'll buy at the grocery store filled with preservatives? I think you just answered the question. Okay. <laughs> I can expand on it if you'd like. Yeah, please do. Please do. Yeah. Like, when did you start the company? Yeah. Um, where do you see the company going? What sure. is your mission? All of that. Sure. So, uh, as I said, my husband had done all the cooking, all the food mm -hmm. preparation, mm -hmm. had full responsibility. Well, I changed my diet. He did not change his. Mm -hmm. So I was suddenly faced with there's some gaps in what and where and when I can eat. And so I had to get into the kitchen and figure that out. And the uh, recipes for read the ingredients, both the loaves and the big bites were created by me to fill the gap of what the hell am I going to eat for breakfast? I mean, it strictly was, it was that simple. It was like, I have now learned because I am just so much more conscious of health and nutrition. I, I have learned that breakfast is important, whether I eat it at eight in the morning or, or 11 in the morning, that first meal of the day sets you up for the day. But from an energy standpoint, from a appetite standpoint, from every perspective, that first meal of the day will set you up. And there was a gap. What am I going to eat? I started with, uh, I had gluten-free crackers and almond butter on them, but that gets old really fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and the other thing that was happening is, as I mentioned, my father, who was still aging and I lived uh, on the opposite coast from him, I ended up needing to travel back and forth to the East Coast quite a bit. Well, you can't travel with crackers and, and almond butter. And you're literally on planes all day long, both directions. And, and what am I going to eat? And so out of that, I created the recipes for uh, Big Bites and Loaves. And it was strictly meant to be for me. And then I started sharing it with other people who had a similar desire, who recognized a similar gap in the market. So uh, to answer the question about what differentiates us, number one, we are not a bar. We are not, I mean, I hate to bring up names, but everybody knows the Cliff Bar and the mm -hmm. RX Bar. And we are not that. Um, yes, we are good to grab and take out on the hiking trail or take out for a run, but our we don't have the preservatives, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, we are a baked item. We uh, have don't have that chewy consistency of, right. as people describe, stick in your teeth consistency. Um, we are calorically a meal. We are, our loaves run between 380 and 460 calories. Right. That is a full breakfast. If you're looking for a cliff bar and you're excited about the fact that it has 200 calories or 170 calories or whatever it is, then, you know, if your calories are your thing, you're going to want to eat a portion of what our loaf is, or you're going to eat one of our big bites because we put two in a package purposely. So they can either be a snack item or a full meal if you eat both servings. Um, but so we're, we're a full meal. Mm -hmm. We are nutritionally better rounded than any other bar that exists out there. You're not going to get the protein, the healthy fats, and, and the um, healthy carbs that right. you're going to get from our product. You're just not. And what you are going to get from other products that you don't get from ours is the sugar. We consciously made the decision. This is for the person who thinks every other bar out there is too sweet, whether right. they sweeten it with sugar or coconut syrup or, or dates or whatever they use. 
they're sweet. And, and some of those sugars are healthier for you than others. However, I still maintain that our goal is to help the person that understands that they want to and should reduce their sugar intake right. uh, for their health. I mean, that is so important to us. I think, I think the acceptance of the negative or the negative health impact of animal products is starting to become more aware. But I still think people, because our palates are so conditioned to eat sweet, that most people are still in denial until and about the, the negative impact of sugar. Absolutely. Sugar well, dangerous. And there's the book Sugar, Salt, Fat by uh, Mike Morris, I, Michael Morris or Mike Morris and it, uh, or Moss, excuse me, um, where he really explains how we have been conditioned to become addicted to sugar, salt, and fat. And people aren't even aware of it. But if you look at the health crisis that we're dealing with uh, beyond the pandemic, just obesity, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, heart disease, uh, cancers that are a direct result of what we're putting in our body. And I want to remind people, this is Kathleen Gage with Plant-Based Eating for Health podcast show. And I have the good fortune and the distinction to be talking with Bobby Judas, Judas Selly. Uh, she is with read the ingredients and this truly is a meal unto itself. Now I will tell you, um, I, I want to point out what's really good about it, but I also want to point out what people might say to themselves the first time they eat one. What's really great about this is you've got a ton of fiber in here, which is something most people don't get enough of. It's got natural ingredients. It has to be uh, frozen before you, you know, as soon as you get it, you put it in the freezer and um, you can either let it thaw out or you can, you can, uh, pop it in the microwave very quickly uh, to heat it up, but it's a meal unto itself. The one I had this morning had 400 and some calories. And what's really amazing about calories is that people are so obsessed with, oh, I can't get it, you know, I can't eat too many calories. When in reality, we need those calories to fuel our body to do the work that it's going to do. Where the problem resides is the type of calories that you eat. Now, when you first eat these, you're your mind is going to say, well, this isn't sweet enough because it doesn't have any processed sugar in it. It's very natural. So there's ways that you can sweeten it with, um, I put some monk fruit on it and it was just a slight bit of monk fruit and it was delightful. And my mother-in-law, she was reading the ingredients. She goes, hmm, a lot of carbohydrates. And I said, ah, but good carbohydrates. So the mind will be conditioned to look at um, the false narrative that we've been given around our health. And um, your your web address is what, Bobby? Go ahead and give it's people your rtifoods.com. Okay. rtifoods.com. So I recommend that people go check it out, order some bars for yourself and really try that. You know, get get a box of bars and try it for a week where that is your breakfast. Um, it it will fill you up. You'll I'm so energized right now. It's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But what do you see? Now you started the company with your son, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yes. Okay. Tell us about how the company started and where you see the company going. Yes. Um, and you're hundred percent vegan, which is one of the reasons you're on this show, because I really uh, encourage people to learn more about veganism. So go ahead and tell us about the company. Okay. So uh, yes, my son, uh, Michael is my partner and this is the second company that we have run together. Uh, the previous one, we, um, I had already started uh, and I recruited him out of his corporate job and said, I really think that we can, you know, build this bigger, do, do another division. It was a completely different industry. Um, and, uh, and we worked very well together. I have founded other companies. I've had other partners. I will tell you, Michael and I just magically worked together as two equals and two partners. And it's only a coincidence that he's my son. Uh, I would choose him over any other partner without any obligation just to note and to hit that 
point home, I have two other sons who I adore, who I'm very close with, but would never partner with them in a business situation. Mm. So this was a very conscious decision. And um, and when we decided or when I started sharing the, the read the ingredients, loaves and big bites with other people and people were saying, including Michael, and people were saying, this is great. There is a need. There is a need. And he and I were getting to the point where it made sense to sell our previous venture. Um, so we did decide that we wanted to take read the ingredients to the market. Um, we uh, did sell our previous company about 15 months ago. Um, and we uh, and, and, you know, every company that I have done that I have founded has been in a different industry and has been a tremendous and tremendously rewarding learning curve. Like, mm-hmm. like I love learning. I love learning. I love growing. That's what drove me into the nutrition research and you know learning about that. Um, but I will tell you that this one, if we had any idea, I don't know if we would have done it or not. This is an industry, the food, CPG food industry is huge. And I will tell you, it was when we identified that the vegan community is where the most concentration of nutritionally conscious people are, was when we magically started to feel like, aha, it was like a eureka moment. Mm -hmm. It was, yes, this is where our people are. This is where our tribe is, our community Mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And it's been a much more exciting adventure since then. Where we want to take the company, we, we, you know, we see into the future. I have never, with all of the companies I founded, I would consider every one of them having been successful and a successful exit. Um, but I've never started any of them saying, that's where I'm going. Mm-hmm. So we kind of go, I go by gut feel. Michael is very similar to me in a lot of ways. And for him, it's gut feel, but also think about the generation gap or the age gap of where we are in our lives. So yes, I'd like to see this company go big. I would like this to be the last venture I do. Um, whenever that is, I'm not in any hurry to retire. I have a million things that I could do, still do, I'm involved in. Um, but, uh, but, One thing we know, we will not compromise what our mission with Read the Ingredients is. So if some large company came to acquire us, it would only be even a starting conversation to say the product will never have these things. It will never have preservatives. It will never have gluten. It will never have uh, animal products. It will, this is our mission. We are looking to um, offer the market, something that will promote good health, not just fill them up in the moment, not just get them over the top in a sport, not just whatever, but to a sustaining uh, healthy lifestyle is what is interesting. And is the only kind of products we're going to put on the market. I, I love that because um, right now there is such a focus on health and, and my frustration resides in the fact that people wait until they're sick and then they do something about it rather than going to the core of their health and eating the right foods, eliminating the foods that are unhealthy. Um, I was on uh, LinkedIn earlier and there was a post about animal-based products and uh, several people were like, we have to eat meat. We need, our body needs that protein. And it's like, no, you, you, you don't need that. And so what do you see as a way that those of us who are really committed to raising awareness around uh, healthy eating, healthy living, what do you see as the most effective way to raise awareness? I'm going to steal somebody else's uh, sentence. Okay. Okay. Here, not necessarily to that question, but um, meet people where they're at. And I think we can all relate to that. We have all had things that took us in retrospect way too long to accept and realize in our own lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you just need to meet people where they are at. You can't prevent people from making their own mistakes. Right. You can't force feed people. Uh, an ideology or a belief system, you need to meet them where they are at and not to change this into a political conversation, but we have unfortunately moved into a culture where people feel like they have to stick 
to what they believe. Like there's not an opening for a discussion about why do you believe that or mm-hmm. how do you see that came to be? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a dangerous place that we've gone, but it's still, I still would answer the question the same way, whether we're in that climate or a more open climate, which is meet people where they're at, give them space to say why they feel what they feel. Right. So rather than telling the dedicated meat eater, no, you're wrong. It's like, why do you believe that? Um, and, you know, and then open a dialogue where you get to hear them out or you get to then share what you know that may or may not support what they are already believing. I, I so appreciate that because I actually have a friend who he was cooking some ribeyes or whatever types of steak. And he was, he had a video and the sizzle was on and he was going these bad boys. And I posted something in a Facebook group. That's a plant-based eating Facebook group. And somebody said, why didn't you just slam him and tell him he's wrong? And I said, because that would serve no purpose. It was his wall. It was his choice to post that. And for me to go on to his wall and basically pass judgment on his choices without looking at a conversation. I said, I would rather have a conversation. So it's the very thing that you just said. Um, And again, I want to remind people that I'm talking with Bobby Giudicelli, and she is one of the founders and owners of Read the Ingredients. And what I love is you've got, I'm going to show right here, you've got vegan, you've got gluten-free, and you've got GMO-free, which is great. Um, So always look for that V, because that means no animals were used in the development of the food or the cosmetic or the clothing. It's very, very important. Um, And I think the more that people learn, the more they realize that we don't need to consume animal-based products and how cruelty-free it is to eliminate that from our diet. So in closing, um, what are your final- One other thing, Cassie. Absolutely, absolutely. But but this has really come, I, I get this question a lot and I would like to publicly answer it. And the question is, What do you do when you live in a household where you are choosing a lifestyle that's not consistent with the other people in your life, Mm -hmm. in in your household? Mm -hmm. And and that is true for me. My husband is absolutely not a vegan, not interested in changing uh, the way he eats that he's eaten his whole life. Mm -hmm. And, and here's how, here's, here's my own anecdote about that. Um, So when I started changing what I was eating, and again, remember, he was doing all of the cooking and all of the grocery shopping. He would give me a hard time about making, well, now how am I going to cook for you? Well, now how are, you know, well, now that's ridiculous. Well, we'd go to a restaurant. I want extra gluten in mine, you know, like it was that kind of scenario. And I realized that that was offensive to me. Um, That was very offensive rather than feeling supported. It was, he can make his own decisions, but no, I want to feel supported in mine because I'm entitled to mine. And I realized the same has to happen in reverse. He moved off that fairly quickly. And then I got more educated and then I continued to make more and more changes. And I would share with him periodically, not very often, why I'm making the changes that I'm making. And, um, and he still has no interest. And I have to be okay with that. All I can tell you is he has seen, first of all, that I weigh less than and look better than I have looked from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Uh, That happened automatically. That was not my conscious decision going into being uh, plant-based or vegan. Um, Number two, my moods are absolutely a lot more stable. Talk to me, girl. You're you're speaking my language. This is awesome. I handle conflict much better. I Mm -hmm. handle dress much better. I handle, you know, I am not an idle person. I am somebody that needs to always stay in action. So my calendar is full. My plate is full with all the things that I do. When something would break, it would put me over the top. It was handling those situations used to be like, oh my God, I'm going to explode. Well, I'll tell you, yesterday we got notice from our co-packer, who's wonderful, who we have looked for forever, um, that we have to find another co-packer for a myriad of reasons that, that are, have nothing to do with us or our product. Um, and, and I was like, I kept saying to my husband last night, I, 
I'm a, you know, there's a, a little bit of a tingle in my stomach, but I'm not full of knots and I'm not going to be up all night going, what am I going to do? Right. And I already know it's going to be, you know, it, it will be take time and energy to tackle the problem, but I can handle it. And, and my joints are not swollen and I'm out there playing pickleball or riding my horse all week long. And, you know, all of these things happen without feeling like I'm 65 years old. Right. And, and, and that is the benefit. And when my husband sees that, that's enough. He slightly moves. He's slightly more aware. I will tell you that if we are on the run in the morning, what does he eat for breakfast now? A loaf. I love, it. I love it for three years before he was willing to even eat one. And now he will easily grab one or he eats big bites when we get off the pickleball court. And I mean, that never would have happened. Right. For three right. years. He said, I don't like it. I don't like it. It's not sweet enough. It's not this. It's not that. I don't like it. And now he's eating it. So patients meet people where they are at and support them like you want them to support you. You know, I, I love what you just said, because recently we, we had some family uh, that, that visited and um, all of them had gained weight during the, the COVID and they all blamed whatever, you know, this, that, and the other. And I said, hmm, I haven't. And I was the oldest other than my mother-in-law who was at the, at the, uh, the gatherings. And, um, I, every day I'd go on a run and they would, I cooked for everybody and it was all plant-based and they're like, there's no meat in here. It's like, no, there's no meat in here. It's like, this is all plant, but this is what plant-based eating is all about. And they're like, tell us more about this plant-based eating. And so I gave uh, my, my sister-in-law, I gave her some cookbooks, uh, the forks over knives cookbook. And, and it really was about them watching me at nearly 67 years old outdo those that were in their thirties. And it's like, Oh my gosh. And they're like, this is really amazing. We have watched you progress. And, and my sister-in-law even said, she goes, you look better than you've ever looked. You're, you're uh, trimmer. And it's the same thing where when I started, I, had given up on diets. I was about 35 pounds heavier than I am right now. And I'd given up on diets because I was a yo-yo dieter, an unhealthy dieter, and the weight just dropped off. It just dropped off. And she goes, well, you know, tell me about the diet. And I said, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. So I really appreciate that you, you shared that. And, and Bobby, in closing, uh, again, I want to remind people, this is Kathleen Gage with Plant-Based Eating for Health. I'm talking with Bobby Judicelli, and she is with Read the Ingredients. And I keep showing you the yellow one. Let me show you this one. And this is uh, carrot raisin. Mm, can't wait to try that. And then banana nut. And then, ooh, 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 chocolate chip. I love it. And um, so in closing, what are your final thoughts for people on how they can live a more vibrant life and make choices that really align with who they are and what they say they want in life? Yeah. So, so for the people that really are just beginning the journey, it's make, put, set yourself up for success. So that means find the weak spots in your day or in your diet and get something there at the ready for when the time hits. So my success came from, I never had to open the refrigerator and just make the choice to eat something I shouldn't be eating because I was hungry and I had no time to figure it out. So set yourself up for success if you're at the beginning. If you're further along on the journey and, 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 and trust in that, the better decisions you can make, the payoff is 20 times more at least. It's exponentially, you get the benefit exponentially. Honestly, I have more energy at 65 than I had at 40. And I was a very avid tennis player at 40. And, and I would be exhausted after an hour, hour and a half on the court. Now I can go for three hours of pickleball and still come home and take my horse out. And you know, it's just a fact. So the payoff is huge. Um, the, if you're further in the journey, I just, you know, for me, I want to keep learning. I never stop learning and listening. And as I shared with you, Kathleen, in another conversation, the one, the one, um, challenge I have right now is, as I said to you, I ride horses. There's an inconsistency in a vegan lifestyle and riding horses for the simple reason. My horse is loved better than any animal you know, but for the simple reason that the saddles are leather, 
my boots are leather. Actually, I've already solved the boot problem, but the uh, the saddles are leather, and and I cannot find a satisfactory saddle that's not leather. And so so I continue to learn and grow. And for me, it has become more than my personal benefits. It's become a, a moral issue, and it's also for me because I know where I was when I was 20, 30, and 40. I want to give back to those people that are struggling, that to those people, I want to find a way that I can encourage you to not wait until you're in your fifties to start thinking about this, um, to not have loss in your family, to not have your own personal uh, health challenges. I, I, and, and my, you know, the way that I felt like I was guided to solve that or to offer that was through our company, read the ingredients. Um, you know, there's a start and we have plans for other products that will consistently help people stay on that Wonderful. healthy lifestyle journey. Wonderful. Well, Bobby, this has been delightful. I wish you much, much success. And I, I'm so excited to see what happens with your company and just the whole vegan movement in, in general. There's so many wonderful things happening. Uh, there's more startups right now that are getting angel funding. There's people that are waking up and really seeing the connection between compassion for animals and what they put on their plate. So for all that you're doing, Bobby, Thank you so much. Bobby is with Read the Ingredients. She's the founder and owner, one of the founders and owner with her son, Michael. And uh, I encourage you, go to the website, check out the bars, and um, you've got the bite sizes and you've got the full bar. And realize this is a meal unto itself and the healthiest meal you're probably going to eat all day long. This is Kathleen Gage with Plant-Based Eating for Health, wishing you a healthy, vibrant, delightful day. Have a great day. Thank you for your commitment to an ethical life through plant-based food choices. The kind of choices that are kind to your body, the environment, and most of all, animals. Be sure to leave a review and rating of the Plant-Based Eating for Health podcast show.